and allow you to respond. And then we'll go to the next uh, uh, agenda item. Dr. Chanchis. Uh, uh, good morning, Jefferson. Good morning, honor members. Uh, thank you so much for, for the opportunity. Um, I just hope I'm clear. Can I, am I clear? I can hear me. We, 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 can, we can hear you, but next time I want to definitely to change that uh, wherever you are. Uh, we hear you, but uh, we, we, we are struggling, but that's fine. Continue. I, I, uh, I actually moved, changed the, I'm in the office. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that it's not here, but we will deal with that, Chairperson. I will address yes. it. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chairperson. Good morning, honor members. Um, I wish all good health and, and peace. Uh, and colleagues as well. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity, Chairperson, uh, for us to brief the committee on the special, uh, on, on appropriations and the, the special appropriation for 2021. Um, I'm with my colleagues, I'm with Dr. Landi, Dr. Mohammed, uh, Mr. Amra, Mr. Petelo, uh, and, and other colleagues. I think Mapula, Dr. Sikatano also will be joining us. The whole team is here. Uh, we'll take you through the, the presentation. I think I am supposed to be loading the presentation. Uh, okay, share. Uh, yes. Share. So thank you so much. We'll, we, we will be taking you through the presentation um, where we, 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 we focus on specific issues. Um, and I think I'll do the opening sessions and later on come back again. And Dr. Alandin and uh, Dr. Mohamed will take the committee through in detail some of the key issues we highlight for the committees for consideration. Uh, but I just want to also alert the committee that later in the, in the discussions, I might have to, uh, you know, join another meeting, the NCOP uh, budget uh, and fiscal oversight workshop. I'm giving a presentation later in the day, so I might have to leave, but I'll let the chairperson know. And But Dr. Alandin will continue with the team. In this regard, um, here is our presentation outline. Um, okay, uh, it's not moving. I don't know why. Okay, let's just. Uh, I don't know why it's not moving. Okay, yes, it's moving now. It's going to switch off my video. All right, to make the, the thing yes. This is our presentation outline. Uh, we we'll focus really on the on the on the on the, 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 the fiscal policy objectives underpinning the, the, the appropriations, uh, but also looking at some of the issues around the reconstruction, reconstruction, uh, economic construction, um, and capital plans. Uh, but also we also try to highlight some of the uh, policy objectives that under, un, un, underpin you know priorities that are set out uh, in in the twenty twenty one budget. Uh, but also we highlight some of the, the, the uh, developmental indicators in terms of you know the spending uh, proposed uh, the capital and, and and what does it mean in, in the medium term but I think we also look at the risks I think yesterday's discussions with the national Treasury on our members raised a lot of issues around economic growth and risks and, and also we highlight some of those as well but also uh, looking at some of the uh, governance uh, failures that have been highlighted, which members know about them already, but I'm just saying to update the committees uh, in terms of some of these governance failures, which will obviously affect the appropriations over the near term and in terms of how uh, the outcomes are realized uh, in, in that regard. Um, I don't know why it's taking long to move the slide. Come on. As I try to emphasize there, uh, we focus on analysis, you know, on, on priorities underpins the, the, the plan, uh, look at the reconstruction recovery, uh, but also look at the composition of spending uh, over the medium term and what are some of the key issues that the committee will take into, into account before approving uh, the, 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 the proposals um, and highlight some of the key risks, as, as I mentioned earlier on. I think. Um, Clearly, the, the 2020 budget proposal proposes significant reduction in growth and expenditure that's last year uh, to, to try to deal with. I think what we've seen over the past couple of years, uh, the fiscal objectives has always been around to stabilize debt, 
and 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 and, and reduce the, the budget deficits as a main main issue. And I think even the, the we've seen from last year there has been really an acceler acceleration by by government to try to uh, reduce the budget deficit and and the the level of debt. I think what we raised last year we keep on raising now it's the the potential implications of the, the, the trying to realize objective in the economic growth and also uh, the concerns that the, the vulnerable in society uh, are not necessarily it's not very clear how the vulnerable are, are protected within this process and 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 the the point that we, we set out as well or the the, the the risk that we raise throughout and we raise throughout the, the presentations around the budget it's the the sense that um you know, it's it's not clear how the reduction of, I mean, the, the fiscal objectives being pursued um, will, you know, enhance economic growth. And I will still highlight in that concern. So it's very important to realize these objectives. But broader issue is ensuring economic growth is realized. I listened yesterday that the uh, Dr. Mump was emphasizing that there's a protection of uh, uh, infrastructure spending seen also as an area where growth could come in. But I think. What we've been trying to say over the years, Chair and Honourable Members, that look, there needs to be a clear discussion around the, the sense how we're going to get growth with uh, uh, the proposal that, that I made out. And I think that's a key message we sent out there. I'll give Dr. Orlandi uh, uh, to continue the presentation um, and I'll come in later in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Dr. Orlandi. Um, thank you, Director, and good morning, Chairperson and Honourable Members. Um, I will take um, the you forward in this presentation. I'll just switch off my video. Um, so members, normally we start our budget presentations with the alignment of the medium term strategic framework with the consolidated budget, but due to the importance of the economic growth and that it is mainly a, a national function that are also funded through the appropriations, we start with the implementation of the economic reconstruction and recovery plan um, which should also guide planning and appropriations in the economic cluster departments. Um, the table shows the priority interventions identified by government, and then we link the main sources of public funds that are appropriated in this appropriation bill um, for these interventions. Um, the information could also guide the monitoring of the implementation of the outputs and the expenditure linked to the interventions in the economic um, reconstruction and recovery plan. So the first priority infrastructure investment and delivery, um, uh, we linked it with mainly to conditional grants in transport, education, health, human settlements, water and sanitation, and also transfers to municipalities. The reason why we also mentioned that um, it could assist with monitoring and evaluation. We just want to give an example of things that went uh, wrong last year. So in transport in 2019-20, 98 million of the public transport network grant was withheld by National Treasury to the Nelson Mandela Bay for relevant reasons. Um, so this is one thing that we could have been um, prevented if, if we monitor the expenditure and the output puts of, of this grant in Nelson Mandela Bay, for example. In 2021, um, this grant was also adjusted downwards from 6.4 billion to 4.4 billion. Um, also um, in terms of several reasons, um, that also includes the, um, the lockdown. Another example um, is the Rural Roads Asset Management System grant. Um, in 2019-20, only 61.7% of the grant was spent. Um, and we can um, continue with, with a lot of examples. Um, we also provided you with an analysis of health and agriculture um, conditional grants in our conditional grant briefs. And we will continue with this to assist you with the monitoring of the implementation and the frameworks of these grants. In terms of the industrialization through um, localization. This is a policy um, that should be mainstreamed in all departments um, and it could be monitored through the, um, the institution that actually monitor this. 
Energy security, it's mainly ESCOM, monitored by the Department of Public Enterprises, shared by the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy, that is also involved with the policy matters and the structural um, reforms in ESCOM. And yesterday we also heard that the National Treasury, in specific the Deputy um, um, the deputy minister is also responsible with this um, or re involved in the structural reforms in ESCOM. So gender equality and economic in, um, inclusion of women and youth. This again is something that should be mainstreamed by all departments. Um, support for the recovery and growth of the tourism, cultural and creative industries. Tourism, sports, arts and culture are mainly involved within this intervention. And in terms of the green economy, it's mainly environment, forestry and fisheries that are involved, mass public employment interventions, funds were reprioritized to several departments in 2021, mainly for EPWP jobs and the outcome should inform the allocation of the provisional allocation in the 2021-22 budget. Um, and the Department of Employment and Labor is also involved within this intervention. The strengthening of agriculture and food security, members agriculture, land reform and rural development. Um, in, in agriculture, it's mainly the transfer of agricultural conditional grants to provinces um, that are appropriated for this purpose um, in the 2021 appropriations bill. In terms of the macroeconomic policy interventions, national treasury is involved, as well as trade industry and competition. Next slide. Um, so members, in terms of revisions we've, um, that government has made to the consolidated government expenditure, um, it basically shows that there's no additional financial support um, for the interventions identified for the economic reconstruction and recovery plan, but structural reforms are recommended. So in addition to the structural reforms, which include policy changes, departments have to reprioritize, work more smarter and evaluate current programs, conditional grant frameworks, projects and plans to eliminate duplication and also identify relevant targeted actions and expenditure. Um, the graph shows that um, if we just look at the graph, the first one, um, we, we see the trend over time in terms of general public service, which also includes the debt service costs that over time, um, since 2017-18, there was a, a slight increase, but from, um, to, uh, from last year, we see a much higher increase of the, the proportion that we spend on debt service cost. Um, when we look at public order, and um, safety, members, you can see it is directly linked to the cost of employment in the police services and um, that has been reduced by 11 billion in 21-22. And over the medium term, the department also plans to reduce the force by 6,000 members per year over the medium term. And yesterday, we also heard from the National Treasury that they are busy with a massive restructuring within the police force. Um, the, proportion, the proportion of expenditure on housing and community amenity, um, amenities are the same as in 2020-21. And this um, function group includes the transfer of conditional grants and equitable share to the municipalities and spending on water supplies and is estimated to increase in the out years. Um, members, just also to um, note the expenditure on social protection, you can see social protection, um, this includes the social conditional grants, um, has peaked in 2020. We've spent 20.4% of our consolidated budget on social protection. This year it reduces to 17% and it's still reducing over the medium term. Next slide. Just also to link to the um, to the reductions, adjustments to the main budget non-interest expenditure since the 2020 budget. Um, we don't have to go through all of these items members because the National Treasury also addressed most of this yesterday. But what we added to this table is, um, you can see in the red, the COVID-19 vaccine rollout, um, 
which is now um, included in the special appropriations. So the the in 2021 the appropriation was 5.2 billion, and now we include another 1.25 billion. The same with the extension of the COVID-19 social relief of distress grant. The initial appropriation was 2.145 billion and government is extending this now in the special appropriations by 2.8 billion. And then also in this table, members, you will see that we've spoken, I mentioned this in one of the previous slides, the provisional allocation of 11 billion this year um, for job creation. This has not been appropriated as yet, but it is a provisional allocation that will be appropriated during the adjustments budget. Next slide. Um, so members, um, just to illustrate the impact of the fiscal strategy on the estimated proportions allocated per economic classification, you can see the reduction in the um, proportions allocated to COE. Last year, we've spent 9.8% of um, the national allocation. Um, and this year, it's been reduced to 9.5%. Um, in terms of goods and services, um, the proportion actually increased from 4.4% to 4.6%, and transfers and subsidies shows a slightly lower percentage, mainly due to the net effect of lower transfers to households in the form of social grants and slight decreases in transfers to local government and an increase in transfers to um, provincial government um, on conditional grants. But members, we can also just focus um, on the transfers to households, which are also included in the total amount that you see that that is 66.5%. Last year, we've spent 13.1% um, of the total national allocation on transfers to households. And that is now um, decreasing to 11.5%. And this is mainly linked to conditional grants. Next slide. So in terms of the conditional grants, although the transfers to households are decreasing, um, social grants still provide continuous protection to the vulnerable. The COVID-19 pandemic required additional support, specifically in 2020. You can see in the yellow column, you can see the social relief of distress. Um, with um, government allocated 17, almost 18 billion in 2020 um, on, so, um, on the social relief of distress grant. This year, the estimated allocation was reduced to 2.5 billion. And now I've also added in the new special appropriation um, of 2.8 billion. So you can see it's it almost increased to, um, to um, six, um, 6 billion in, in the current financial year, the social relief of distress. Um, so members just also to mention in terms of the expenditure on the uh, social relief of distress grant in 2020. So in be between May 2020 and February 2021, 17.356 billion um, was paid out um, to, um, to clients. And um, the, the number of people that got this grant um, ranged between 4.4 and 6.1 million. Um, in um, during the course of the financial year. So what it's saying is that um, six, uh, 6 million people are, um, benefited um, from this grant last year. Next slide. Uh, members for this presentation, we also decided to include all departments um, to get a holistic picture of the composition of the 2021 appropriations. So um, you will see in certain departments, CO is the main cost driver. Um, for example, in the presidency, the presidency spends 62% of, of the budget on compensation. The Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation spends 66.7% and Public Service Commission 75% of the total budget on COE. But also many national departments, as we've also indicated before, transfer funds to other institutions to deliver services on behalf of the national sphere of government. Um, 
for example, in corporate services, you can, um, ach, corporate governance, they basically transfer 95.1% of the total budget. But what we also see in this overall picture and analysis um, of the, the proportions and the composition of budgets, that um, if, if, if departments transfer a huge amount of money to other institutions, um, the COE is generally below 10%. Um, as well as the goods and services. So there's a correlation between um, COE and goods and services. And in, in most departments, the, the proportions spent on um, goods and services are lower than the proportion spent on COE. But when we, you can just look further down, um, yesterday there was also a discussion on Stats SA. When you look at Stats SA, um, you can see their COE spending is 33.1%, but they spend 59.8% um, uh, on goods and services. So this is an outlier in terms of the, the general trend, in terms of the, um, the proportions that departments spend on COE and goods and services. Um, also, when we look at basic education, the COE is only 2% and they spend 7.7% on goods and services. The same with health, social development. You can see the, the correlation in social development. The COE is 0.2% of the total expenditure and goods and services um, correlates. It is also only 0.2%. Um, the next slide. Uh, so the same scenario is also found um, in uh, the same scenario as in Stat SA is also found in military um, veterans. In this case, the department spent a high proportion of the goods and services on contractors. Um, the you can see military veterans, uh, the, the proportion that they spend on CO is 19.4%, and then the goods and services proportion is much higher. And um, I actually went into the detail of the department and I found that that um, additional or increase in expenditure is ba ba basically um, um, with regards to spending on contractors. In terms of environment, forestry and fisheries, um, they, it's the same scenario. Um, the, the goods and services is also much higher um, in relation to the um, COE. And the main expenditure there is um, spending on agency support and outsourced services. So members, when um, we look at the police force, um, that is a total different uh, scenario. It's actually um, uh, the reverse of the other uh, trends that we find in police, the COE um, expenditure, the, the proportion is 78%, um, but their goods and services expenditure is only 16.9%. Um, 16 so um, this is already indication that further analysis or, or further investigation needs to be done on how they do their business. But we also heard that the police services um, are busy restructuring. So it will make a huge difference in terms of the proportion that they spend on compensation. But there might also be underlying um, expenditure matters or composition of their budgets. It might be that some of the goods and services are um, included in COE because um, in my mind, there should be a lot of expenditure on uniforms, but I couldn't find an item in goods and services that re reflects expenditure on uniforms. On this table, again, members, you can see um, that there's a lot of departments that has got a high percentage of transfers um, to other institutions. Um, so members, um, uh, what we want to illustrate is that by analyzing and comparing the um, composition of the budget, um, but still taking into consideration the business of different departments, one can already identify departments where further evaluations could 
um, identify efficiency gains. As I've indicated, departments where we found it's totally out of the general trend. Next slide. So members, um, this table um, just isolate the departments that transfer to provinces and local government. Um, so this is the departments that don't transfer to other institutions, they just transfer to provinces and local government in the form of conditional grants. These conditional grants are mainly for infrastructure spending, job creation and skills development linked to the economic reconstruction and recovery plan. And um, the transfers by other votes are made to public entities, government components or other institutions that deliver services on behalf of government. Um, and those transfers are not always easy to monitor. So that's why uh, we isolated these departments because at least they are much easier accessible and to monitor the expenditure. Um, in this table, you will also see the green and the yellow line. Again, um, we've added the special appropriations, um, the 1.2 billion and the 2.8 billion. Next slide. So, members, we've spent um, some time on trying to get a better understanding of the main cost drivers and the composition of expenditure within departmental budgets. So, the question is how um, we use the departmental information and other structural analysis to improve the composition of budgets to be more efficient and effective. This slide also shows other possible inefficiencies that need to be addressed um, by evaluations. Firstly, um, in terms of a macroeconomic structure, um, uh, we found that there are also other departments within votes. For example, in vote 11, um, there's a, um, in public service and administration, there's also a department, Center for Public Service Innovation. So this department has got 30 personnel um, the budget is 42.6 million, of which administration costs is 21.5 million, um, which also leads to the conversation um, to the proportions of spending on program one administration in all votes. So we've done the um, calculations and it shows that um, the proportion that departments spend on administration is between 0.7% and 51.9% of their total allocation per vote. But when we exclude the transfers, the proportions change to between 29.8% and 100%. Another inefficiency is the duplication of functions within departments and between departments. We've seen it in our analysis of conditional grants, uh, the conditional grant frameworks. Um, and there are also poss possible duplications, for example, in the government communications and information services versus the public service administration, which also have an e-government service and information management unit, um, and also versus public service commission. I don't say these are examples that we will find duplications, but it's just an example. Next slide. So members, just to illustrate what we've been saying about that cost of administration. So you can just look at um, vote seven, National School of Government. Um, National School of Government spent 51.9% of the total expenditure on program one administration. And if we um, deduct the, the transfers, then the National School of Government actually spend 100% of their budget just on administration. Um, if you look at um, about 33 human settlements, um, they spend 1.5% on administration. But if we deduct the transfers, they actually spend 52.7% of the appropriation on administration cost, um, specifically program one. Um, the same with science and innovation. Um, they spend 3.7%, but after taking away the transfers, um, they actually spend 57.6% of the budget on program one. Next slide. 
Um, so members, this is just a summary of the special appropriations. We've illustrated um, the special appropriations throughout the presentation. Um, it's the special appropriation for health, um, which is 1.25 billion. Um, and a pro proportion of the spending will go for research. I think 1.1 is going towards vaccines and the other um, 500 is going towards research projects. And then the appropriations of additional amounts to social development, it's 2.8 billion um, for the social relief of distress grant. And then the other adjustment to the appropriations um, to public enterprises is just a reprioritization of 2.7 billion. Um, it's been reprioritized from SAA to the technical um, company. 1.7 billion, um, Mango is getting 809 million and the Air Chefs um, company is getting 218 million rand. Next slide. Um, so members, this is just a, a list of condition and no grants linked to programs that have been revised so that the, the funds can be spent on COVID-19 re related item, items. We don't have to go through them because that it's not that they received additional funds, it's just that the, the frameworks has been um, adjusted um, so that they can, it allows for expenditure on COVID-19 related expenditure. So I will hand over to Dr. Mohammed. Thank you members. Thank you, Nina. Good morning, Honorable Chair. Slides before we hand back to our director. Um, this slide uh, shows real per capita spending, and um, what, what it does is uh, it looks at the expenditure over the medium term expenditure framework, taking into account changes in inflation. Um, and so prices and, and uh, making prices comparable over the years from an economic perspective. Um, and we also then uh, divided by population using um, estimated population uh, forecasts and estimated population growth. Um, uh, Dr. Madise from National Treasury, I think did a really good job yesterday explaining the consequences of the across the board cuts so I won't have to go into this into more detail, but it does give a sense in terms of looking at the person in, in real terms. So basically the, the, the spending uh, of what you can get for one round of money over the years, how that changes. And we see that in, in um, if you look at, especially using 2020 as a, um, 21 as the, a year, most of real per capita spending declines, but in, in areas like higher education, police, um, and, and I'll show you on the next slide, transport health, we actually see um, lower real per capita spending um, than we had before COVID from 20, uh, in 2019-20. Um, and, and I think these, uh, I, I won't go into more detail because it was the consequences in terms of Things like policing um, was explained yesterday by National Treasury that the, 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 the ratios change and the ratios seem to change quite drastically from um, in that we also saw in the budget review how class sizes are going to increase, um, pupils per teacher in basic education will increase and we're also looking at um, figuring out how to provide um, in his first money over the next few years um, and, and the, those constraints caused by that. Next slide, please. So yes, this slide shows health, transport, um, even in things like water and sanitation, we don't see real per capita spending increasing. Um, and we, we see actually compared to what we had in 2017-18 and 2018-19 in the real spending per person, actually comes down quite a lot. Um, and even taking into account the lessons of COVID and the need for households to have access to clean water, able to keep their hands clean and uh, uh, proper sanitation for, for general health purposes. And next slide, please. <clears throat> 
Now, um, we, we titled this slide fiscal risk, reputational risk and credibility because we, we, we actually feel that there are problems related to how setting um, certain targets and, and um, pushing for fiscal consolidation uh, as a way to achieve those targets could be a problem that could actually affect uh, credibility and, and reputational risks. And, and uh, as we've been saying over the last few years, and uh, particularly uh, during 2020 with COVID, is that continued fiscal consolidation will likely continue the multi-year trend of repeatedly missing debt reduction targets. What we're seeing developing is a, is a cycle, and it's happened over quite a few years now, tending towards a decade, where inadequate government expenditure into an economy affected by a crisis or a recession or poor performance, in South Africa's case, very high levels of unemployment. Um, we, 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 we actually sit in a situation where government expenditure into the economy is really important. And if government's not spending enough money in the economy as a, a consumer and as an investor, that is going to constrain GDP growth. And, and growth is required to reduce debt to GDP levels and fiscal consolidation has constrained economic activity and growth. And so we're actually seeing fiscal consolidation as a really important contributor to poor GDP growth and also then to higher debt to GDP and interest payments to GDP um, uh, levels. And over time leading to higher um, uh, repayment, uh, debt repayment to GDP level. And, and with this, the, the kind of credibility risk related to not achieving the goals set out um, also creates problems in, in, in debt markets, bond markets, etc. <clears throat> the next risk we talk about is prematurely discontinuing COVID-19 relief to households and small businesses, which could ne negatively impact long-term growth and government revenue. The reductions to real expenditure in key budget areas will probably not achieve fiscal consolidation, but may ne negatively impact future revenue collection by negatively affecting aggregate demand and GDP growth. A new wave of COVID-19 could show that there's a large inadequate budgeting for COVID-19 relief in the 2021 budget. The credibility of government's medium-term expenditure framework and budgetary goals are in question because government may be forced to compromise on reducing the uh, cost of expenditure uh, linked to reneging on the wage agreements, which negatively affect, also affect labor relations, and determination to reduce the cost of expenditure could negatively affect morale and productivity in the public sector and ample initiatives to reduce waste for expenditure and corruption. So the, the fallout could be beyond just um, uh, not achieving fiscal goals, but uh, overall productivity levels. Thanks for changing the slide. Um, in terms of the fiscal risk, we put up um, uh, government's guarantee exposures. I won't go into that in detail. I think uh, these are now fairly well known in terms of the numbers. We did coming, reducing slightly from 2021 to 2022 to 22, 23. But the uh, Poor financial management of local governments and government entities may require more expenditure to maintain local government and for, to meet uh, contingent liabilities. There's also a concern that uh, state owned companies and government entities would guarantee they may continue to have governance problems, poor management that negatively affects poor performance. Fiscal consolidation and poor economic performance linked to the pandemic could continue to negatively impact revenues of state-owned companies and their financial positions. Further declines in credit ratings could negatively affect national government finances directly and also guaranteed the guarantee, and also the guaranteed debt of government entities and state-owned companies. Um, so I just want to apologize. Uh, there's, there's some work going on outside my house, road work or construction work. And so you probably um, a jackhammer or something in the background. I apologize for the noise. Uh, thanks for going to the slide. So in 2019 20, the financial management in state and enterprises is clearly a continued risk to the fiscal position. 
um, SOEs are in serious financial difficulty, state-owned entities are in serious financial difficulty, they did not submit financial statements for auditing, including South African Airways and LMT products, which are under business rescue. SA Express is under provisional liquidation. SOE is disclosing financial statements showing future uncertainty includes petroleum, oil, and gas corporation, SABC, the NEL, and three subsidiaries, uh, the Land and Agriculture Bank of South Africa, Palkin, South African Nuclear Energy Corporation, and ESCOM. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, this table shows um, over time. Um, so going back to 2008, nine uh, through to 2023, the recapitalizations and bail are to state-owned companies. Um, look at ISCOM, South African Airways, the NAL, South African Express, EC Land Bank. Um, and we see that the 2021 appropriation bill seeks to appropriate 31.7 billion to settle ISCOM's government guaranteed debt. 4.3 billion to settle SAE's government guaranteed debt. We say that this fiscal support to SOEs must be considered in the context of previous and ongoing support over 300 billion since 2000. And eight. Next slide, please. Then um, the last uh, section I'm going to deal with is uh, looking at global risks and, and seeing that these uh, are a problem and also not allocating enough within the medium term expenditure framework and also the, the, the appropriations with this here could be a problem to South Africa. Now, uh, we list the global risks that affect South Africa's economy and budget as increasing climate change events, uh, such as droughts, flooding, and fires, the possibility of more pandemics and other health crises, private and public debt accumulation, and risk of financial crisis and contagion. Here, we're not talking about South Africa, but globally. Um, um, and we've seen with COVID. The, the, the focus has shifted to uh, the increases in public debt accumulation and, and declare, uh, you know, worsening debt to GDP levels across the world. Um, but, but we shouldn't take our eye off what's happening, private debt, uh, corporate debt, and also um, what's happening in financial markets and, and uh, kind of um, uh, exuberance, one should call it, or uh, profligacy happening global financial markets on the, on the private side. And that also happens happening in South Africa, it will also be affecting um, the South African economy, either directly or through contagion. Um, we, we see that, um, you know, in, in countries like the US, but also uh, in, in other developed countries, um, that, that there's sort of signs of improvement, especially since last year, because of um, a very large stimulus programs, but there is, I think, a very real concern looking forward of poor performance of key economies and global economy. So basically, the trend that happened before COVID uh, of declining global GDP growth, poor performance in major countries continue, and and um, in, in some of the larger developing countries, um, we, we're not seeing. Uh, as rapid an, uh, an improvement, um, and not only the larger, but also smaller countries. Also, the, 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 the recovery processes in some of the developing countries may take much longer than in developed countries where the rollout of the vaccine is faster. Um, we are seeing high and rising levels of unemployment, inequality, and instability even before COVID and with COVID. We Fairly drastically, and our quarterly economic bulletins um, the last few we've actually mentioned the numbers for for rising global and, and, and across the world uh, unemployment rates that have increased inequality and stability, and basically also poverty levels globally, uh, and affected the achievement of the sustainable development goals. And and with all these things, particularly increasing inequality. Um, we're seeing increasing political instability, even in developed countries, um, and the possibilities of more conflict uh, internally, uh, but also war across border countries. Any of the above risks could impact on global and domestic economic performance and negatively affect the fiscal position. Government may have to increase expenditure and lower revenues. 
the first bullet point there is basically say, uh, talking about the incidences uh, and like COVID, you know, if we, uh, we have, and if we do have a pandemic or if we do have, um, like we saw in Cape Town recently, a large uh, fire in the mountain that destroys property and, and things. Uh, so climate change events and health crisis could require large expenditure layouts and severely curtail revenue of, of government. Then uh, the second point deals with mitigation re related to those, those risks. Climate change and health risks require increased public sector expenditure and investment to mitigate the potential impacts. Higher global debt levels and risk of financial crisis can constrain debt markets and push up interest rates while lowering investment levels, growth, and revenue. The rebound of the global economy after the pandemic may be short-lived. And so we may see that uh, global economic um, factors uh, not supporting uh, a fast recovery in the South African economy as well, and, and that affecting revenue in South Africa as well. Growing unemployment and inequality combined with climate and health risks lead to heightened risk of political instability, conflict, and migration. Next slide. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. I think I'll carry on from here. Thank you thank so you. much, uh, colleagues. Uh, Honourable members, I think at the beginning I, I meant to also just uh, give you the heads up that the finance um, committee has invited us to brief them about the progress of the implementation of the economic recovery and construction plan. So we will next sometime next week we'll be happy to share with with the committee some of the uh, uh, information that we found in terms of how far we are in terms of how far is government in terms of implementing the economic reconstruction and the recovery plan. Uh, since the budget was presented, Chair and non-members, uh, AGSA has released the uh, 2020 performance uh, PFMA audit outcomes. It has noted that um, we thought we should highlight some of the key issues, key governance issues that the committee should take into account as well as part of oversight process. Uh, it's noted that sustainable solutions required to prevent accountability failures are still lacking in, in many governments, entities, and departments. Of course, it's from last year. As I said at the beginning, that it will obviously affect the government expenditure or performance in the, in the next year. I think some of the adjustments probably take place in the October. Um, and they also emphasize the importance of oversight, uh, you know, and specifically on, on, on the need for oversight on state owned entities, uh, you know, on those, particularly those who are poor, health, financial health, and, and some of the key service delivery areas like your know, education and, and health. There's a need for closer oversight on those areas. The financial, man financial management uh, discipline needed for, to protect public money and, trans and ensure some transparency are still needed. Uh, also need to prevent leakages and money that has been lost must be prioritized to all accounting officers. But I think in a way, when we draft on site uh, models or plans for the year, that should be we, we, we recommend that should be taken into account in, in, in that regard. And, and, and highlighting specifically, um, I mean, the, the AG noted that there were signs of improvement in some of the areas, uh, but I think um, the, the financial health generally continued to be alarming uh, in, in many entities, many government departments, uh, uh, both from the national and provincial uh, government level. Um, with, with some of the entities remain insolvent and an increase of fruitless wasteful expenditure over, over, over the, 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 the past uh, year compared to the current the year that was put in that regard. So we thought we should highlight this as well as some of the areas that uh, when you look at the, the, the uh, recommendations on the proposed appropriations, this would be taken into account as whether um, will the, the amounts allocated be used for fully. Lastly, to conclude, uh, what we're saying is that the fiscal strategy uh, in, in the 2021 budget is to curtail non-interest non expenditure growth and to adjust composition of expenditure, taking into account the, the support to household income as households, uh, you know, low-income households, uh, of course, increasing funding on healthcare due to the, the pandemic, and, and also, as the treasurer mentioned, that um, you know the, the, the continued support for capital infrastructure, and, and also trying to get the recovery. But I think what we're saying is that, notwithstanding the, the, the negative 
impact of the, of the, the, the COVID on society, uh, budget proposals fail to really show how the vulnerable society and economy protected, even if, you know, uh, the, you know the, 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 the commitments are made in those three bullets up there. But, we, you know, it's not clear how would that, uh, you know, be implemented without, uh, you know, sacrificing some of the uh, economic uh, development indicators of the chief of years and also stifling the economic growth in the process. The presentation demonstrated that the main adjustments that are required to the main budget, uh, non-interest expenditure since 2020, which includes those which has been included, and also uh, adjustments are meant to provide for additional funding where it's needed immediately, like healthcare, um, and also provide to make adjustments as, as provided in the budget, previous budget. As part of this strategy to adjust the composition of spending, the presentation further provided a summary of composition of appropriations being proposed, showing how what's the medium term. Uh, the summary should give an indication where adjustments could be made uh, to the composition of expenditure. The summary does not include all the programs, of course, we just said we highlight some of a few of them. We also look at the provided the committee with the real capital expenditure, which is a bit of a risk with raising that we've seen the decline of the years. We've seen the years has been declined in the capital expenditure and also that noted by government as well uh, in terms of, you know, where are they, um, you know, it's, it's a competing interest where, but clearly uh, that has affected the spending per household. Reduction to real expenditure is key budget areas are likely to achieve fiscal consolidation. I think the main point there is staying We've been in this path for a long time, um, but but we, we have not realized the the, 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 the objective itself, keep moving the, the goalposts, uh, whereas uh, there's an indication that the, the demand in the, in the economy is actually sacrificed in the process. Other fiscal assistance, such as the reduction in wage bill, public finance strategies, and management, as well as the global economic movements are likely to delay realization of fiscal objectives, as, as we say in there. And lastly, we do emphasize that in consideration of the proposals, a lot of them have been since the February, um, and that should be taken into account uh, in terms of how it affects the current proposals in, in this regard. Chairperson and other members, thank you so much for the opportunity. I think that's where we'll stop and take the comments. Uh, just an additional slide there. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, um, <clears throat> Dr. Janchis. Dr. Olani, Dr. Mohammed, and the and the team that is supporting you, all members, we have come to the end of the um, of the pre of the presentation by PBO. Then I will I will I will get hands uh, of the people who would like to engage with the presentation. So uh, there are not many of us. Just a shout out uh, your your name. Let's see it. Let's go, oral members. Matafa. Oral Matafa. Kaiso. Oral Kaiso. Mlenzana. Oral Mlenzana. Any other member? Thank, thank you. Um, oral Matafa. Um, let's let's work on five minutes and see how far we go. Thank you very much, Chair. Now, mine <clears throat> will be very brief. I don't think that I will reach five minutes. Uh, let me start by first uh, to thank the presentation, Dr. Janjis and the team. The presentation does really help in us engaging on these issues. Chair, I just need to raise a very high level questions with relation to the current fiscal developments. And the high level questions are aligned with uh, the commitments that were made by the president. And I'm more interested to hear if whether PBO did pick up some of these particular efforts coming forth from departments in order to help the president and the country achieve what uh, the president has set us to do. But before I continue, Chair, let me also apologize for the background noise. There's a construction uh, next door, just like the prof was presenting there. The first point, Chair, one of the priorities of the president was uh, the youth employment initiatives 
which would have required 1% of the country's budget to be set aside. And, and how that would, be, would have been set aside was going to be through the slicing of the budget. Now, now how I understand it, it would have meant that some money, which will equal to 1%, would have been redirected from various departments to specifically target youth initiatives in terms of addressing the scourge of youth unemployment in the country. I'm interested to find out if whether PBO is picking up any of these particular efforts from departments to ensure that this becomes a success. Now, I'm raising this chair because in the president's announcement and subsequent discussions, there were specific initiatives like the youth prototypes in provinces, which would have required funding. Now, whenever there are budget cuts, such initiatives as they are new, normally suffer. I'm interested to find out if whether is this a uh, commitment by the president protected. The second one, Chair, it's, it's I think what the country is grappling with on a daily basis, the commitment to fight gender-based violence and, and crime in general. Now, yesterday when the National Treasury was presenting to us, there was an issue of key personnel recruitment or failing to fill vacancies in almost all departments due to the budget adjustments. Now, now having said that, I am interested to find out if whether would PBO have identified if whether key personnel required to fight GBV and crime in general, particularly in the space of uh, justice and SAPS, if whether would they be affected as well? Because what we have realized is that in certain instances, as a country, we lack capacity to deal with these particular challenges. And some of the capacity would require human as well as systems implementation. And unfortunately, this comes with a certain amount of cost. I, I just want to find out if whether, is this a battle that we are likely to win or is the focus still on this one? And unfortunately, in most cases, Chair, um, whatever that you do in the country, you must translate what you say or commit to in how you spend your money. The expenditure must follow the strategy. On the issue of SOEs, I, I, I agree with the Auditor General that there is a much need to ensure that there's accountability in that particular space. Now, again, the President made a commitment of trying to stimulate uh, economic growth. And we have identified the transport network as one of the key drivers of economic growth. Now, I'm interested to find out if whether is there an observation also that there is a commitment to address the issue of the ailing transport system. Firstly, the maintenance that is required due to wear and tear, but secondly, especially as it pertains to the train service. During the lockdown, there has been a lot of vandalism that was experienced in the rail network of the country, particularly on the passenger, uh, passenger lines. Is there a, an effort from, from the transport department and government, as well as um, the public enterprise to ensure that these particular challenges are, are addressed? Because we are sitting with a situation where uh, most passengers have now resorted to using taxis, which is expensive, and impact on their monthly expenditure. And it obviously eats into their revenue that they bring into the house. I know of a neighbor in Soshanguve, where I come from, who just decided that, no, I'm, I'm leaving this job because I can't have a situation where 75% of my money goes into taxes and I come back with only 25%. So I rather hustle within the community where I live in instead of going to town. So he's selling on the street corner, somebody who had a meaningful employment. So that for me is a, a matter that is close to, to my heart. The, the, the last one, Chair, is, is on the uh, issue of uh, the sovereign debt and, and how it correlates with the, with the GDP. I just want to find out if whether the PBO has uh, uh, inquired how, how, how far are we or how far is the debt, the, the gap between debt and GDP. And, and if whether the current fiscal situation will exacerbate the situation that we are likely to have an increased debt, particularly as it comes to the service costs uh, for, the, for the debt consent. 
for now, Chair, I will, I will pause there. Those are the issues that I just wanted to bring to the discussion. Thank you for the opportunity to engage, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Matafa, Honorable Kaiso. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, I just want to ask a few things here. Uh, firstly, let me thank and welcome the presentation made by uh, PBO. Uh, so I just want to get into the space where uh, Nelly was presenting on the, yeah, or on the areas of performance and the allocations there and then you know, expenditure. <clears throat> I've seen or I've noticed that when we were dealing with the, uh, let me start with the cooperative governance. Uh, that the COE there was a, a 0.3 percentage. I just want to check whether is it not the situation uh, that you find in the police and the office of the chief justice because they are as uh, COEs was around uh, the police 78 percent and the office of chief chief justice is at 74 percent is it not the similar trend that you probably think there might be something wrong there that you need to look or to come up with a, a better explanation to, to understand or to comprehend that uh, because you believe that or you suspect that there might be other figures which have been perhaps been conflated with the COEs uh, rather than uh, goods and services. So I just want to check that because I, I, I a 0.3 percentage on compensation of employees uh, and that 4.6 percentage on, on, on the government services, it doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of, you know, balancing all those figures. <clears throat> now, coming to public service and administration, I think the, 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 the Department has to deal with this, uh, Honorable Chair, uh, the duplication of functions. Because the sooner you deal with the duplication of functions, uh, maybe the better uh, uh, the department would uh, at least be uh, presentable in terms of, you know, your functions, your organogram, et cetera. So I think there has to be a recommendation that the public service and administration, when we meet with them, they have to look at this duplication of functions uh, so that it should be an element that is going to assist moving forward. <clears throat> now, I, I, I didn't hear anything around the issue of how does the PBO see the issue of, you know, dealing with corruption uh, in general uh, being raised at this level, because I think uh, it's one of the risks. Uh, I, don't, I don't see it being included in the risks. So I think it should have been one of the risks that uh, it's been uh, included there. Uh, because you can imagine, for instance, if we have an entity such as ESCOM where we have uh, over 100 cases of uh, criminal cases being opened there, uh, what risk uh, uh, is, is, is the entity facing there? So I'm just saying, raising a principle that it, it, uh, the, the issue of corruption should have also reflected as one risk as we're dealing with these issues uh, moving forward. But I didn't get the PBO raising anything around it. Uh, now, I agree with the issues that uh, my colleague has raised with regard to economic recovery plan, you know, as to how far is uh, progress? Although I understand that the PBO is going to raise with us in in few time, uh, in few days to come, as to how far have we uh, have now the programs have aligned and the uh, and the output thereof since the announcement by the state president. <clears throat> and uh, yes. Uh, 
Now, on 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 issue of uh, the, I, I didn't hear once more on the issue because you raised the issue of household uh, de uh, a decline in terms of transfers, uh, given those years that you've highlighted in the slides. But I also want to check the PBO's, uh, you know, uh, understanding of the implementation of the basic income grant that, don't you think that maybe this is recommendable to be implemented uh, to intervene in that specific area? Uh, although it is a lot of, you know, uh, discussion taking place, but don't you think that is about time? Because looking at the, uh, what you say in terms of the COVID-19 new wave and, uh, and, 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 uh, and doing away of the, of the COVID-19 relief uh, budget uh, that people were getting, it, it's going to exacerbate the situation that you referred to earlier in that slide, which deals with uh, you know, household uh, income. Uh, uh, so I think it, it, it is important that we, uh, that this measure of you know, COVID-19 relief budget has to be reviewed uh, in order to um, match with the current developments in as far as a threat to a third wave of COVID-19 and, and, and given the situation that is developing around COVID-19 around the world, I think it, it has to be relooked such that now at least our people are able to, you know, uh, get a to sustain and survive the difficulties of the economy during this period. So those are my few uh, inputs that I wanted to make around uh, chapters and the, the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Taiso. Um, um, let me also join the other members uh, thanking PPO for their, for their, for their input. Uh, it, it definitely helped help us. Um, Honorable Matafa and uh, uh, Dr. Mohammed, it's good when there is noise behind you of construction because it means the economy is picking up. So <laughs> <laughs> I think we should we should celebrate that. Um the chairperson when they buy. <laughs> oh, the, there's also construction. Oh, sorry, sorry, honorable Milenzana, please come in. Sorry. Yes, thanks, Chepesin. Thanks, Chepesin. In fact, mine mm. is also uh, one but generic uh, question. Uh, in fact, two uh, questions but generic. Uh, let me start by joining colleagues and welcoming uh, the presentation by PBO. Uh, it's a mouthful and uh, it's sharpening our tools of analysis. Chairperson, let me start by, yes, I understand that uh, Dr. Janchis was saying in a few days to come, they would be coming to us to, to talk to us on the roadmap uh, towards uh, the economic recovery plan and all. I, I would then shelve my questions regarding that. I will not talk to it. But then, Chairperson, if Dr. Changes and Tim could reflect to us uh, their analysis of uh, these uh, various uh, budget cuts in terms of uh, the negative impact that they pose, general uh, and specifically to those uh, entities and departments, which uh, we have lifted through SONA uh, in the presidential injunctions, like your education, like your health. Uh, do, we, do we see now, or do we see the realization uh, of the implementation of the president's injunctions uh, happening? if there is going to be this continuous uh, cuts. Also, Chair, linked to this question or a new one, I'm not sure. Uh, 
I understand to the changes uh, through some views around the risks. But now, mine, I'm not sure whether it would be falling there under risks or what Shepherdson will be guided. But then, where do we locate uh, the, 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 uh, the consequent uh, management uh, against uh, the, the, the implementing, uh, I mean, implementing agents or departments which either delay or do not implement infrastructure projects. Uh, I'm not sure, Chairperson, whether I would I would locate this into a impact assessment. Uh, what we've been saying as to where where at, at what stage are we actually uh, checking or following up as to whether the budget does have an impact or not? Uh, it, it's just those two, Chairperson, uh, because my interest really would be realizing that uh, this budget be the parliament's uh, pass and tool towards a uh, uh, economic recovery, uh, basically. Thanks, Chairperson. Thank you, Arabun Lenzana. <clears throat> uh, if uh, anybody else would like to come in, our members, before I do. Ye yes, Chair. Uh, just one question uh, that I've forgotten to raise. I just want to get the, the view of the PBO around this issue. Uh, you know, when the, the budget growth, or I mean, the, the growth on the economy and the and the cuts which were being announced, especially around the salaries, uh, wages, and the projections which Treasury had made. Uh, do you think that now that there is this loud noise around outside uh, the issue of you know salary freezes, do you think that is that is that is those projections still you know applicable given that uh, amount of noise that you pick up outside around this uh, salary wages freeze thank you chair thank you honorable kaiso chairperson uh, yes honorable matafa thank you chair in one of the slides i think it's the one that speaks to soes it states that sa express it's under provisional liquidation. I, I'm interested to, to find out what is the current situation because I saw uh, contracting, um, contradicting statements in the media. One statement was saying that as we speak, SA Express assets are being sold in batches. And, and, and the other one was stating that uh, SA Express is still under business rescue. I'm just interested to find out if whether PBO knows the actual state of SA Express and, 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 and um, where, where is the entity as far as uh, its uh, life is concerned. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Arma Tafa. Um, uh, thank you, uh, uh, PBO leadership again. Um, the, the Presidential Youth Employment Initiative of 11 billion rand uh, it's, uh, it's still not uh, allocated. So from your point of view, uh, where, where do you think uh, should, it should go to uh, with a, a bigger and better multiply effects um, and a, a high propensity to create jobs if you were to find yourself in a, in a position where you were to uh, advise the president? Uh, where do you think that uh, the, the higher propensity to create jobs uh, will be found if you were to allocate to this. Uh, secondly, the question of the credit guarantee scheme. Um, um, it has been extended according to, uh, to the communique which was released by, uh, by National Treasury. But uh, um, it's, uh, 
the banks had only dispersed about 18 billion rand uh, of what we thought was going to be a stimulus of 200 billion rand at the beginning. So that's uh, that's less than less than less that is less than 10 percent. Um, if you were to critique the credit guarantee scheme, what would you say? Because uh, for sure, what was intended to be <clears throat> achieved with it uh, is, has definitely not been, been achieved. If we could only disperse, or the banks could only disperse, disperse about 10, less than 10% of the total credit guarantee scheme. If we were to critic, what would you say? And uh, perhaps uh, uh, in future, how do you deal with this type of uh, an intervention, both by the National Treasury and uh, uh, the South African Reserve Bank? Uh, Dr. Mohamed, you spoke about when you spoke about the risks that we should look at. We, we talk about uh, uh, that we, we should also be looking at the at the developments around the debt in, uh, of of private sector internationally for obvious reasons. But uh, if, you, if you don't mind, and if you do have inf information, what is happening with the, the local, uh, uh, what is the position of the local private debt? Um, I think we, 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 we have had a number of people uh, when they critic the, the, the budget, uh, they created the budget by talking about the, ex uh, the extended consolidation period and uh, the, uh, the cuts uh, in all now, in all the votes, there have been cuts, right? But now the question is, um, and we know the reason is that the, um, the receiver um, uh, uh, <clears throat> Is under, is under collecting because of the economic conditions that we find ourselves in. But I would like you to uh, uh, perhaps uh, just say, what are the alternatives of money? Because definitely we need to spend money in the areas that we are spending money at. For instance, we can't do anything. We need to, to intervene as far as health is, 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 is concerned. But at the same time, we, we, are, we are cutting. What are the other sources of, of, of funds? Uh, remember that we also talk about the, uh, the, the debt, which is unsustainable, which is pardoning. So um, if you were to advise this commit, what, what would you say? Um, I would like to refer you to, 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 to slide 14, where you talk about transfers and administration. Uh, I think it's, 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 it's Dr. Olan. Can, can you just repeat exactly what is the point that you are trying to emphasize there? What are you drawing our attention to? Uh, then on slide 13, slide 13, uh, you were talking about departments where there's a potential of efficiency gains. Uh, if you don't mind, please uh, just share with us which are those uh, uh, departments and uh, what do you think should be done with them. Then you spoke about the mili milita military veterans. And uh, I think what you said is that a lot of money is due to contractors. Exactly what, what's happening, what, I think the bigger percentage goes to the contractors, if my memory serves me well. What do you think are the type of questions that we, we must ask the minister when it comes to this? Uh, I'm trying to find out what do contractors do with the military veterans? Because military veterans are people who, have, um, who, who are no longer with the, uh, with, with, with the force. So what's happening with the contractors? I don't know whether you do have any information on that. Um, Then we spoke about the, the, the green economy interventions. And, and uh, what, what's curious is that uh, is the responsibility that you, you, you seem to be uh, giving to the uh, environment, fisheries, and forest department. Um, 
don't you think that you are, you are limiting the interventions because I, I think the code of government general is for, is for every department to try and get and, and go green, but by and large, I think the, the Department of Public Enterprises and, and DMR are the departments again, which I should be in the forefront of, of this, apart from the uh, environment, forestry and fisheries. I'm saying public enterprises, for instance, you know, ESCOM, uh, 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 it's, 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 it's one of the, of the companies and I'm sure many other companies uh, falling under uh, public enterprises and, and energy. Yeah, I think I've, I've, I, we have given you a mouthful, uh, 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 Dr. Chanchis and your team, please can you respond? Dr. Janchis, are you not muted? Dr. Olan, Dr. Mohammed, whoever can come in. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Um, I, I can I can start um, um, with some of the responses. The first um, matter was raised by Honourable Matafa in terms of um, the youth employment. So this is also one of the things that we try to show throughout this presentation. So the Department of um, Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities, they transfer, um, I, I just want to uh, just make sure that I'm there. Um, that department transfers 73.7% of the budget to the Commission of Gender Equality and the National Youth Development Agency. So one of the points that I try to emphasize is that it is much easier to monitor the outputs and the actions and the performance of the Department of um, women, um, youth, and persons with disability. But it's not easy to monitor the outputs of the entities to which they transfer. Um, because if you go to the, we have access to the um, quarterly performance rep um, reports, the database, um, since the presentation to this committee by DPME. We asked them for access, so we do have access. So we have access to the information of the Department of Women, but that department will not reflect in the quarterly performance report the outputs of the entities. And uh, the entities are not on the database. So the whole system of performance reporting are getting so complex and difficult um, for parliament in specific to get that information and really to monitor. So if we need to get that information and make sure that we monitor if the Department of Women, Youth and Persons with Disability are monitoring the entities, we will have to call on that um, department to come and present to our committee. Um, so that is with regards to the, um, the um, gender-based violence, as well as with, with the youth employment. Um, also in terms of gender-based violence, there are many indicators that we can follow in the police service, as well as in um, justice, because there is a duplication of reporting in both those departments on the files, on the cases, on the outcome of the cases. So there are a lot of statistics that one can follow within those departments. We haven't do the analysis, we can, or the other alternative is basically to ask DPME to come and report on, on the QPRs. Um, it's the performance on the APPs, which is their responsibility. Then um, in terms of, um, uh, uh, members were interested in the proportions that we spend on corporate governance. Um, Honorable um, Kahigusu, uh, the Department of Corporate Governance, it indicates that they spend 0.3% of their budget um, on COE. And in line with that, they spend 4.6% of their budget 
on goods and services. But one must remember or realize that that, that department transfers 95.1% of their budget to local government in the form of the local government equitable share, as well as the um, the conditional grants to local government. Um, in, in the other table where we calculated the, um, if we, um, okay, it's not in this, but if, if we um, uh, deduct the, the um, transfer to local government, you will get a total different picture in terms of the, the proportions that the department on, on COE and only 16.9% of the budget. So it's almost like you, you get an indication of there's something different in the police services. So is it because um, it's a total different way of doing business or are there something underlying? Um, we haven't done an, an analysis, but the Treasury actually indicated yesterday that they are doing reviews and evaluations on all departments. So those evaluations will also come out in those um, analysis or reviews that they are doing. Um, but also in terms of police, what we can see in terms of the information that we have in the E&E, &E, um, the police actually started already with a um, vacancy rate of 2000 positions. Um, so that might also be um, one of the reasons why the, um, the treasury um, reduced their budget by 11 billion, the COE budget. So, so there are a lot of underlying things within the detail. And as I also mentioned, I tried within the information that we have in the E&E, &E, we don't have more info information um, like um, what the National Treasury has, um, is that we can also look into the database if you really want a budget analysis on the police services to get a better picture. But I also try to see um, what they spend their funds on. And it's basically on the vehicles that they use. That is the main contributor to the goods and services budget. But I couldn't find any item, perhaps it's just hidden in, in, in the database or in the E&E &E, on what they spend on uniforms because most of our policemen are in uniform. So, I mean, it might be that the uniform um, budget is somewhere hidden within COE. We don't know, we need further um, analysis on the police force. Um, you also mentioned justice. Um, justice spent 56.8% on the um, compensation, but the goods and services are still in line with the general expenditure of between 20 and 30% on um, goods and services. Um, but it also makes sense that justice spend um, a higher proportion on COE because it's driven by COE. Um, so yeah, that was the question in terms of the balancing of the composition of, of budgets um, and how this analysis actually indicated where we must look in further and um, do further analysis or evaluations um, in terms of the compositions. Um, Growth Public Service Administration, that was just a comment. Um, we didn't look at um, the corruption as a risk. Um, and then um, in terms of the analysis um, of the budget cuts and the negative impact to those departments, um, members, you will not see the negative effect um, in the budget numbers. You will only be able to see the negative effect in the performance information. And again, um, that we will have to call on the Department of DPME to come in because in our previous engagement with them, they indicated that they will do the analysis of all the APPs that were submitted of departments. So then they will be able to indicate whether there were um, reduction in, in the targets um, 
uh, in relation to the output. Um, and we haven't done, if the um, committee wants the PBO to do it, it will take some time because we are only um, five people in the PBO that can do analysis at the moment. Um, and, and we will only be able to do a selection um, that you indicate to us of departments if we have to do analysis on APPs. Um, and then, um, Honorable Putelezi, you spoke about the 11 billion that was not appropriated. Um, where should we allocate the money? Um, we are also intended, the PBO are intended to also look at the current performance um, of the previous allocation of funds for the employment initiative of the um, of the presidency, but one must also realize at this stage they were also, they were only um, allocated for short term positions. This eleven billion um, is there, but it's just an once off allocation. It does not have a carry through effect. So one cannot um, allocate these funds for continuous or um, positions or permanent positions. It's just a once-off allocation, um, such as allocations or additional allocations for short-term positions. Um, and then the need to spend other sources. Um, um, Honorable Budlesi, you also asked about um, in terms of slide 13 and 14. Um, and it, it's almost this, uh, it, it links to the question that was asked by Honorable Matalfa in terms of the pr proportions that we spend. Um, and, and where can we get efficiencies? Um, those departments that actually um, that we can find the um, it's different from the the proportions that they spend are different from the general um, proportions that the departments spend. Those are the indications that we get that um, one must look further into those departments, such as stats. Um, Stats uh, South Africa. In general, most departments spend less on goods and services than on COE in terms of the proportions that they spend. But in Stats South Africa, um, they spend more on goods and services than on COE. So it is an indication that um, one should actually look into the way they do business or on what they spend in terms of the goods and services. Um, the same with um, this. The same with the military veterans. The proportion that they spend on COE is nineteen point four, but then the goods and services are quite high. And already, um, that is just one item that I've identified. Is it might be because they spend additional funds on contractors. Um, instead of COE. So that might be the reason why the COE proportion is less than the goods and services. But the EME also does not provide an entire range of items that one can identify, but that, that is also an indication of further investigation on what the military veterans actually spend their, um, their money on. Um, I also looked at the transfers and most of the transfers that they do is to households. And um, also to mention is that the veteran, military veterans spend a lot of funding on training. So it might be that the contractors are for, for the training programs, but they also um, provide a lot of bursaries um, to military veterans and their families. Um, which are then locked up in the transfer budgets. So there's a lot of um, detail within the departments that one can do an analysis on. And then environmental and forestry, they also spend um, a, a bigger proportion on goods and services. Um, and that is basically also on, on contractors, but that might also be, it, it might be, the norm 
in terms of how they do their business because environmental affairs has got a lot of um, projects um, in terms of the green economy, in terms of um, um, alien vegetation, um, which they might use also contractors or cons um, to do the work for them on behalf of them. But it's, but it's um, captured in goods and services and not in transfers. So the composition of that budget is also different from the general proportions that other, um, so one can also look more into the detail and how they do their business, or even the department can come and explain um, why the composition is um, like that. Um, yeah, um, um, Honorable Butelezi, um, we are also, as soon as we finish with this presentation, we're starting our um, presentation and analysis on the economic recovery and um, the recovery plan. And that will definitely include um, more information on, on the green economy and all the departments that are responsible um, for the green economy. Yes, um, uh, Siraj, if you want to continue on the economic section. Excuse me. Dr. Mohamed, we can't hear you now. What's happening? Oh, sorry. I, I've been getting messages that my my connection is unstable. Um uh, are you why don't you why don't you, you switch off your video and let's see how okay I'll turn off my I'll turn off my video. Thank you. Thank you. Um Yes, so uh, is that better, uh, Honorable Chair? Yes, it is much better. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I think the, the main issue that's come, or one of the issues that's been uh, raised in all the questions has been related to the expenditure cuts. And um, in, in your last question, Honorable Chair, you also raised the issue of fiscal sustainability and quality of your presentation was coming out very clear now we are really struggling to hear you what's happening uh, um yeah. I think I think my 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 in, I think my internet is unstable. I'm I'm really sorry about that. Um, yeah, stay where you I, are. We can speak now. Uh, okay, okay. But I haven't been moving, but it, it seems to go in and out. So I really apologize for that. It seems uh, it seems to happen also at the worst moments. Um, uh, just let me know when you can't hear me, and then then I'll I'll stop and I'll see if I can fix things. Um, so, so the, the the as I said when I was presenting, I thought that um, National Treasury yesterday in their presentation did a really good overview, or, or and and she went into some detail of where the cuts uh, would happen. And as you said, they would be across the board cuts, but it showed that they would have um, fairly um, significant impacts at at the community level, um, and and the the issue of uh, um, crime and gender-based violence came up, and we saw that the, the, the cuts to the police will reduce the ratios uh, of, of police uh, per thousand people in the country um, beyond uh, sort of the, the kind of benchmark that government has been setting itself. Um, we also see, like as I said earlier, basic education, um, pupil class sizes, and pupil teacher ratios are going to get worse. And and I think a lot of that. We need to take uh, into put in the context of what the situation was before before COVID and the, the struggles we've been having in in education with crime with um, gender based violence etc. And as uh, problems of unemployment and poverty increase, I think globally we've seen that there's a correlation between between crime and gender based violence and and 
um, uh, also other things that erode the social fabric uh, related to growing po uh, increasing poverty and unemployment. So, so the 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 impacts of, of I think those cuts uh, on society and and so to, so it's not only the the multiplied impacts or the negative multiply impacts on the budget. Um, uh, on the GDP and what that means for revenue, but the overall impacts, but also in terms of thinking about economies as part dependent, where what, what you did yesterday and what you're doing today is going to affect you in the future and, and not, not necessarily only in the, in the short term, but also in the medium and long term. And I think that's why we're seeing in, in, in many uh, uh, developed countries uh, an, an effort to, to put in place uh, very large stimulus programs. Um, now in South Africa, I recently saw an article uh, which uh, I need to do more research on to see um, how credible it is, but they said in South Africa and also in other developing countries, um, on average in South Africa, there was about 66%, but on average more than 60% um, of the relief uh, and stimulus packages related to COVID went to big business and, and um, the sort of two thirds or less went to poor households and small, small businesses. And so we see that even, uh, even those kind of uh, efforts have, have been, have been um, support, more supportive of, of sort of, uh, of, of uh, wealthier people and big business than, than of, of, of uh, the poorer people and, and haven't been adequate to deal with the problems of uh, increasing unemployment and poverty and, and the social impacts of those. And in South Africa, the, the across the board cuts that we're seeing over the medium term framework, I think are going to exacerbate um, those problems. Um, uh, so, so, so that brings us to the question then, you know, fiscal sustainability. Um, can government spend more, um, What's been, we're not going to raise money. And, and I think here we've seen, um, uh, am I still audible, uh, audible chair? Yes, you are. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, everything went very quiet. So I was wondering. <laughs> Thank you, Felix. Um, so so the, in, 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 in microeconomics, you know, the, there is no, um, uh, there is no clear, Proof or evidence that shows, you know, uh, that you 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 can have only a certain level of debt to GDP. In South Africa, and the way that National Treasury is presented it is that we begin to run into a cash flow problem because our our debt repayments to GDP are growing um, as our debt grows, and also we we we're seeing that that causing problems with uh, things like credit ratings. Now the response in developed countries and uh, what we've seen uh, during COVID, uh, including in I think uh, almost 20 developing countries is greater use of uh, central bank direct funding of, of government, um, uh, of often called quantitative easing. And, and this sort of made me think about the the credit guarantee and, and the fact that 200 billion of the 500 billion that we had set aside for our relief had been had, had been form of a, a a credit guarantee that has as you know not not even come close to touching the kind of impact that we would have wanted to see and and uh, support to the economy um, and it, it raises the questions that if if government was willing to you know, to guarantee that debt and the, uh, the Reserve Bank was willing to put that money into the private banking system to on-lend, why could that money not have just been directly um, in, 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 um, infused into, uh, into government's budget and, and helping with sort of the term framework? Uh, um, and, and I think that that sort of uh, is related very much to thinking about how governments have responded to the, the, the COVID crisis and, and um, try to stimulate the economies and what they can and can't do and what the role of central bank um, funding, even if it's just temporary in this kind of situation can be. Um, there, there are also other things I think that have been raised in public hearings and that, and I won't go into alternative sources of financing, but I think the, the big issue that I, I think I mentioned at least twice in my 
when I presented was that in, in, in this kind of situation where, where the, the economy is, is sort of struggling along, even if we are going to see some um, bounce back, that the amount of money that government spends and invests into the economy, whether it comes from borrowed money or whether it's from reallocating money from other pl uh, places within government, um, whether it's on cost of employment or whether it's on um, investment in infrastructure, but at the macro level, that spending in the economy makes a huge difference to recovery and the possibilities uh, for future growth. Um, and 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 uh, it has a huge, I think, uh, social impact. So, so I'm not going to carry on with that point, but I think, um, uh, in terms of what is sustainable, uh, you know, there, there are lots of big questions uh, about that, and that, that answer is not clear from um, economic theory. But I think what we're seeing, uh, especially in developed countries, but in many developing countries, also in countries like China, is that a big effort for government to directly stimulate the economy through spending and investing into the economy, not only in infrastructure, but also uh, social expenditure and helping with um, increase, increase debt. Um, and that we should be aware that uh, a lot of our expenditure may have actually not benefited in South Africa. On um, the uh, issue of uh, state-owned entities um, and corruption, I think we, we sort of, uh, put corruption under the broad label of, of management and governance and the problems of um, poor, the, the continued problems and, and poor management. And uh, as you saw when Dr. Bochy is presented you know, from the Auditor General's um, comments as well, concerns with that. And, and so in, in thinking about um, go to uh, and enterprises, state entities. Um, it, I think a lot of effort needs to be put into um, jacking up management and also governance at the board level. Uh, um, related to uh, infrastructure expenditure and, and, and the role of, of state and enterprises is, is, is also important uh, there for the future. Um, and, and one of the things we're hearing from government is that is the, we don't have fiscal space to, to spend money. And so we need to be leveraging more private sector money. And, and for me, I, I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not saying that this is the wrong approach, but we have to be really careful, I think, and in future oversight, think about what this means for maintenance of current state-owned uh, assets, um, provision of water, electricity, et cetera, and, and then um, the second thing is uh, how to impact on contingent liabilities in the future, because a lot of PPP programs depend on government actually reducing risk. Um, things like demand risk, where um, you know PPPs need some kind of support and guarantee to say, you know, if if there is a reduced demand in the economy because of uh, I don't know a recession or maybe. Um, there, there isn't uptake for services they're providing, or people can't afford to pay the, the tariffs, then, then government steps in and actually closes that gap. Uh, the, uh, the other is sort of reducing uh, the, the risk of debt and help and, and helping to mitigate that by sort of signing agreements at the multilateral level internationally. And so, so the, within a lot of these PPPs, the contingent liabilities will, will be off budget and not on government's books, but it could be a, a threat in the future. Um, and so that's something we uh, think about. Um, one of the honorable members made a domestic income grant related to, I think, the, the situation. Uh, the poverty that, and unemployment that existed before COVID and has been exacerbated by um, the pandemic. Um, the, the, the PBO hasn't done a research project on the basic income grant yet. We're actually developing a research agenda um, for the rest of the year at the moment. And, and I think um, this is what, what we have been focusing 
I mean, in the past that will definitely feed into this kind of discussion is the situation of households and household debt, household employment and poverty um, and the resilience or lack of resilience of households, particularly um, given the, the ending of um, the, the, the relief uh, related to uh, the COVID uh, package. And so, so overall, I think we, we don't want to come in touch on whether we recommend a, a basic income grant, but I think there is a recognition that we do need to do something to support poor households and also people who are out of the current system uh, um, as a way to, to deal with the, the broader socioeconomic problems, but also in terms of um, the stimulus that that can give to the economy in terms of increasing aggregate demand and the possibility of increasing the Sorry, I, I just, uh, I knew there was... I'm sorry, uh, Jay, I, I've lost my, my uh, train of uh, Maybe someone wants to remind me of questions we haven't covered. I have uh, forgotten what the Mr. last Mar one. Thank you. Mr. Mar Can Hello? you come again? What was <laughs> Sorry, um, so I'm, I'm going to end there. Sorry, I had another question I wanted to cover, but I've forgotten what it is now. So I'm sorry about that. Um, but uh, if if members uh, want to ask questions that we forgot to cover um, in our response, uh, maybe it will come back to me. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mohammed. Uh, the chairperson has just cut off. So I'm just chairing this session to finish off. <clears throat> Honorable members, uh, is there any uh, matter that we have left out so that we can be able to step off from the discussion and responses from the PBO? And uh, in as far as I'm concerned, I think all the hands were taken. Yep, and given one round, uh, oh, the chair is back. I was checking whether are there any uh, issues left out during the discussion that uh, perhaps PBO needs to stamp out so that we can step off from the item. <clears throat> yes, Chair, just, just one follow-up um, question, if I may. Yes, yes, may proceed, Chair. I, I just, obvious when you listen to the presentation, there are many uh, um, issues which come which relate to when well, all of them re re related to portfolio committees but i wanted to just take one example um of an anomaly between this uh, coe and goods and services in police and i think uh, dr Olan was saying that there is definitely an anomaly there which we 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 don't understand for now they must still research on it but i was just checking um how often do you make presentations to other portfolio committees? That's one, or do you get uh, invitations from other portfolio committees? Because I'm sure some of these things are very uh, uh, relevant to them so that they can follow up while we are not, because we, we are not in a position to meet all the departments. Um, uh, I don't know whether Dr. Olan would like to respond to that. Um. Um, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. No, we do not, and we haven't received requests um, to present budget analysis to any of the portfolio committees as yet. Um, and there's just one other remaining question that you also was interested in is in terms of what's the point of showing um, the proportions that we send, spend on administration. Uh, this is basically all about... Um, how can we change the macro structure of government? Because they, we've got such a lot of small departments that basically just exist um, almost as a post office and just trans transferring money, but they still um, spend a lot of money on um, administration. 
So basically, that's the main expenditure. And it's not just one or two. There are quite a few of them that might be um, introduced or um, merged as a program within bigger departments um, with the same vision or, or aim. Um, so that's basically the point that we want to show in terms of the, the, the cost of administration. Thank you, Honourable Chairperson. Um, I hope um, we've covered all the questions. Um, Sorry, Honourable Chair. Um, I, I just remembered the question that I was going to cover but forgot um, which it was. Um, I don't know if we have time uh, for, for me to just uh, respond to that. The question uh, that you asked about uh, the issues of private finance in South Africa and the risks that that could pose. If I can go, ahead. so yeah. um, what what we've seen um, uh, in the pandemic is that you know before before COVID uh, we saw decreasing levels of, of household um, disposable um, debt to disposable income, um, and and that is actually the ability of governments to sort of, of households to pay down debt decreased during COVID as, as household income declined. And so we're seeing households uh, moving back to the uh, debt to disposable income levels um, of close to sort of the, around the time of the global financial crisis again. Um, and, and what we're seeing, uh, uh, some of the South African financial institutions projecting is that um, that, that this trend is going to continue even uh, yeah, a few years into when, when COVID recovery happens because people have been using their, their access to debt to, to make up for the loss of income, especially middle-class incomes. And there's a sort of uh, concern then of what that's going to mean for aggregate demand. And uh, if interest rate levels in South Africa do increase, um, they work sort of brought down partly uh, also because uh, of the Reserve Bank wanting to support uh, households and businesses during the, the pandemic. Um, but if, they, if, if there's a concern with uh, inflation, that, that may actually then also put a further uh, pressure on households. And households are unlike government in the sense that um, they, they're very limited in the increase in debt they can take on. Uh, uh, governments are less limited than households in that sense. So, so that, that poses a risk to, to aggregate demand. From, from the financial market side, we actually have seen, and this has been a global phenomenon, that, that um, returns in markets and, and sort of activity in, in equity markets have, have remained quite high. There's also been increased use of um, uh, Debt instruments, really like de derivatives, um, of what they call specs, uh, and those things that that come with uh, the possibility of increasing systemic risks in, in in the economy. And South Africa has been has been there. Now, one of the risks to to South Africa in terms of investment is that as the the returns in the, uh, the financial markets remain uh, relatively high, that that capital gets allocated towards short-term financial activities and, and not towards investment and not necessarily to support um, uh, in uh, government infrastructure drive, for instance. Um, there also may be uh, an increased allocation of, of capital generated in South Africa, maybe if there's a, a, a commodity super cycle looming as, um, and, and we may see higher um, minerals prices uh, for our exports. You know, some of that money may actually be drawn towards the developed countries that are showing a faster um, recovery than South Africa and into their markets rather than into South Africa. So, so that, that could, um, could actually um, be a constraint on investment and GDP growth as well. Um, but, but also the, 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 the threats to uh, financial stability um, related to, to those things. Um, uh, the increased financial market activity and, and the possibilities of, of problems in financial markets, whether it's localized or whether it's global, I think remain. So um, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, thank you, Honorable Kaiso. I was also uh, getting an unstable uh, connectivity. Honorable members, uh, I'm not sure whether there's any other pending matter that would like to take with the PBO. Okay, in the absence of, of any follow up, um, I, I, I think um, it, 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 it may be prudent for PBO when they're not interacting with the, the finance committees, that they also identify some of the committees and they become proactive. We just uh, a request to, have a, 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 to brief the committee about matters affecting their, uh, 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 their, their portfolio. What, 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 what do you think, uh, uh, Dr. Neil and, and, and Dr. Mohammed? Um, yeah. yeah. Mm. So, Nilia, do you want to go first or should I? No, you can. Okay. Um, I think, uh, you know, we, the, the PBO is definitely open to, to requests from committees. Um, and I think uh, um, uh, I wouldn't, don't want to speak for the director. But I think we would be open to sort of being more proactive and, and reaching out, especially when we're doing research like on the ERRP or um, specific areas uh, uh, that relate to their work. I think my one concern is um, that uh, we, over the COVID period, we've, we've uh, lost two um, analysts uh, and, so, uh, that, and we haven't um, replaced them yet. And so, so we, we are sitting with um, a smaller amount of technical staff to, to do um, more research. So, so where our existing research, I think, is it would be useful to other departments, um, and, and and it doesn't entail much more new work and 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 uh, labor hours. I, I would I would definitely say that we would be open to that, and and um, it's something I think we can discuss with the director, sort of uh, in how we approaching other committee chairs and being more proactive in in presenting uh, our work existing work to them. Thank you, Chair. I think Neely wants to add anything. Okay. Thank, thank you, Siraj. Um, Honorable Chairperson, um, yes, um, because we are such a small um, institution or component, um, it will be difficult actually to reach out to a, a lot of portfolio committees, but also we also don't want to intrude into the space of the researchers because they are also doing budget analysis although they are not doing budget analysis on the entire budget. Um, but I think one option for us might be that we can also discuss in, in our board meetings and with the chairpersons of, of the board of the PBO is a possibility to present some of our work to the chair of chairs. Um, I don't know how you feel about it, but that is one option um, in the interim um, with, with the capacity that we have. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. It was very nice to have such a good discussion with the committee this morning. Thank you. Okay, let, let, let that be an ongoing discussion. Um, um, and I'm sure let's uh, do, let's, let's take it up with the, the, with, with the board um, of, um, of, of, of PBO, uh, where chaired by the, the chair of chairs. Eh? So where we can see, I'm, I'm just looking and one one is 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 quite sensitive to the constraints again of the uh, of the PPO would like you to uh, to chew more than you can bite. So resources allowing time allowing where we think we can add value, I think it would be a good thing to to do. Uh, it will be more about adding on what the researchers do. We do have researchers ourselves here, yeah, but we don't see PPO as a, a, an intrusion. We, we see them more as being complementary to what our researchers are doing. But that's fine, let, let that be, um, um, it's, it's just because I was seeing the value that we are getting and thinking that our colleagues in other portfolio committees, uh, time allowing, resources allowing may also benefit, but that's, that's, that's fine. Thank you very much for, 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 the, for the presentation. Um, and I, <clears throat> I think we were able to do the number of things the text care of agenda item number three, Darren. 
Do you have any announcements? No announcements, Chairperson. Okay, thank you so much. Um, our next meeting is on? Next week, Chairperson. Next week. On, on Tuesday? Yeah. Okay, all right, members. Thank you, thank, 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 thank you very much. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, takes us to the end of the meeting. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. And uh, 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 Dr. Mohammed. Yes. Our our condolences are here that you say you say you have lost two of your staff members. Am I correct? Well, we, uh, I, I, well, I was thinking I, I should have rephrased that. We didn't lose them to COVID. We lost, they moved on to other positions. Oh. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. sorry. I, when, after I said it, I actually thought that the wording was wrong during this kind of crisis we had. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, they, fortunately, they are healthy. Um, but um, yeah, I think uh, at least one person I know want, uh, wanted to be closer to to. Uh, uh, parents and family in in Khateng, which which I think had a big influence on the decision. Um, and so yeah, so but we've we've lost two valuable members of the team, and hopefully um, with HR in Parliament we can um, recruit two people very soon no, but, uh, uh, to to replace them. Yeah. Uh, okay. Please convey to to Dr. Chanchis that this this move fast to 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 fill to fill up those positions. Uh, you, yes. you are pretty stressed with them. How much more if again some people have, have, have resigned for whatever reason? So we'd like the work of the parliament to be constrained. Let's do it fast. Eh? Okay. Yes. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank. We'll pass on the message. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, the, the meeting is agenda, as I've said.